This is uh, uh, our uh, uh, conversation on patents, innovation, and competition organized by the Florence School of Regulation, the Florence Competition Program and the Florence School of Regulation, Communications and Media. Uh, this, uh, uh, let me just, I'm Pierluigi Parque, let me just mention that this is uh, uh, an abstract, a short abstract of the uh, scientific seminar of 2020 that we were supposed to have at the beginning of the year, in March of uh, this year, it obviously was postponed for the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, then we hoped to be able to organize this in September, but as, as is clear, was impossible. So we decided in the end for this year to have this uh, uh, online conversation, reserving only one of the panels. We had many papers, it's a pity that we had to let many papers go. Let's hope we manage to do the scientific seminar next year and maybe some of the best papers can come back and uh, we'll see. And anyway, this is a good occasion to discuss. And so we choose uh, this uh, session, this extract of the, same, of the uh, scientific seminar to do this conversation on patents, innovation, competition. Let me simply say that also we are we had during this difficult year to reorganize our activity. And so we have moved online uh, our trainings and uh, also our events. And uh, let me simply mention, and maybe uh, Elisabetta can share for a second uh, one slide, that we are going to start anyway in a few, in few weeks, uh, our uh, annual training again. This year, the annual training will start with a module uh, that will be concentrated on 5G, 5G understanding policy and challenges. Um, this module will be a training, so you'll find, anybody who is interested can find the information on our website. And also the training will be accompanied by uh, webinars on the Thursday, the, while the training is, uh, you need enrollment and, and the fee. Uh, the webinars are open, you need only enrollment. It will be uh, a series of webinars on 5G in the time of pandemic. And this will be on Thursday. The first one will be um, uh, the 19th of October, if I remember well. I don't see here the date. Um, anyway, you'll find all the details for this, uh, for this in our uh, website. Uh, this will be only the first module, then there will be a second module more on competition teams that will be also concentrated on a single team. In this case, the team will be um, control of concentration. And then we hope to have the third and final module on digital uh, regulation and competition next uh, spring, uh, early summer in Florence, but that's clearly uh, an hope more than a certainty. If not, we will go online also on the third model. Uh, details of the second and third model will be on the website later. Um, the first model, all the details are already there. Okay, I think we can move to the uh, to this uh, say uh, to this uh, conversation. We will have two sessions. The first session is on standardization process between the technical and the institutional. It's the title, and there will be two papers. Um, papers have different authors, but here we'll have Justice Baron and Pierre Larouche for the paper on the technical standardization ecosystem and the anatomy of institutional decisions made, the case of SDOs IPR policies. And Jorge Contreras on balance requirement for standard setting organization. These two papers are very well connected and they talk to each other at uh, the scene. And uh, they will be both discussed by Igor Nikolic. Let me mention that uh, uh, participate, people participating can ask questions uh, using the chat. So after the discussant, uh, the chat uh, questions will be picked up by the presenters. Okay, uh, presenters have 10 minutes uh, uh, for the presentation. Let's get started. Okay, so I suppose it's me? Yeah, just. Um, that, uh, that 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pierluigi. Thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this uh, early stage paper, um, which is on uh, the technical standardization ecosystem and institutional decision making the case of intellectual property rights policies. So this is joint work with George Contreras and Pierre Larouche, who are also here on the call, as well as Martin Husevic and Nicolas Tum. So as a background, um, many of you know, or probably all, uh, there's a lot of uh, research and policy interests in uh, SDO policy choices on intellectual property rights, in particular patents. Um, however, this debate is mostly normative, um, focusing on what would be appropriate policies for, uh, for SDOs. And there's a more limited research that describes the variety in SDO policy choices and even less research that tries to understand how SDOs make such decisions. And we, in our joint report that we completed for the European Commission last year, have tried to begin to fill this gap by providing a comprehensive analysis of the governance framework of 19 different SDOs, where we try to understand the reasons for which uh, SDO policy choices differ in terms of the in internal governance architecture of different organizations, as well as the position of different organizations in what we call the standardization ecosystem. So um, the ecosystem for us is uh, the, uh, the sum of all the external factors that apply to an SDO and constrain its policy choices. So in this research paper, what we have tried to do is to build on the empirical material that we have uh, gathered in, for the report on this particular aspect of SDO policy making and try to embed that in a more explicit conceptual theoretical framework. And hopefully this will eventually provide a rigorous structure for the analysis of SDO policy choices and policy changes with a focus on mechanisms of circulation of new policies in the ecosystem. By circulation, we mean that a policy that is uh, first attempted in one SDO then eventually gets more widely adopted by a larger number of organizations and eventually might even become an institutional norm shared by a large number. So my talk today is going to be very brief. I will just mention that we have uh, analyzed and described four different models of conceptualizing relationships between SDOs, which we try to then uh, condense into a three-layer model of SDOs. And then I will mention that we, we introduce this notion of the standardization ecosystem as an attempt to provide an integrating framework for all these different types of relationships between SDOs. And in the case of IPR policies, this model then results in the concept of a baseline IPR policy, which is kind of a prediction of this ecosystem model. And um, so there are four different models of organizing the relationships between SDOs, and we can categorize them as vertical relationships between SDOs and horizontal relationships between SDOs. So among the vertical relationship between SDOs, once again, there are two different models. And the first one, and maybe the most familiar and most traditional one, is to understand SDO's position in the ecosystem as a position in a tie of hierarchical structures. And uh, um, there are two uh, hierarchical systems to which many SDOs are sub sub subject. One is obviously the legal requirements to which they are subject and by which their policy making is constrained. That includes general legal requirements applicable to all SDOs, such as competition law, but also many organizations are actually subject to very specific legal requirements, including laws and uh, contracts with governments that specifically designate a particular SDO and formulate rules for these SDOs to follow. So in this model, the predominant model for the circulation of policies is, is, is a top-down circulation. So the innovation, the, the introduction of new policies mostly arises at the highest hierarchical level. But since these policies then are expected to be followed by a large number of organizations that are subject to very different constraints, these policies at the highest level are formulated in a very general manner. And at the lower level, the policy making is mostly cast as providing guides for implementation or interpretative policy statements. So the, the opportunities for these organizations to formulate deviating policies is constrained and limited. Overall, the system is characterized by what we might say is a degree of inertia and indefiniteness. So there is over the last decades a tendency to move away from this hierarchical structure and to um, replace it or to um, 
supplanted with uh, a bottom-up structure where basically SDOs themselves have a higher responsibility for policy making, but then they seek accreditation or recognition of their processes by a hierarchically superior body. And uh, there are two different models for that. Either the SDO itself gets accredited, so a famous example of that would be ANSI and its accreditation process, but also many countries have accreditation processes by the government. The other alternative is that individual standards get accredited, accepted, or recognized in, in different ways. What, what's peculiar about this process is that the locus of policy initiative is at the lower hierarchical levels, and then the policy innovations of, what's, of these organizations then might contribute to clarify and uh, interpret the meaning of this encompassing regulatory framework. So, and we, we have called that a soft precedent. If, if a policy has been reviewed by one of these hierarchically superior structures and uh, been deemed uh, compliant with this uh, structure, other organizations might look at that as providing guidance to what might currently be permissible under the structure. Um, in addition to these vertical relationships between SDOs, there are obviously important horizontal relationships. The most uh, familiar one, the most uh, discussed in the literature, is the potential for SDOs to compete with each other in multiple ways, competing for uh, technology contributors, but also competing for implementers, competing for members simply. And uh, one prediction that exists in the literature is that this type of competition leads to a race to the bottom, where SDOs are afraid of making any kind of stringent policy requirements because that might uh, lead to uh, stakeholders fleeing to other SDOs. Uh, we have tried to ex uh, analyze it quite extensively to which extent these competitive forces really arise. The most uh, immediate uh, form of competition, which would be basically to vote with your feet and take your work elsewhere, is probably not viable in many circumstances, especially with regard to these large organizations. Nevertheless, many other competitive responses might exist. So we, we do recognize that uh, um, competitive forces are a significant factor shaping uh, standardization and SDO policy choices, but it's context specific and applicable to some organizations more time than to others. Finally, SDOs are not only in competition with each other, they also share similar traits and many common interests. And so you could consider SDOs to be a field or a population. And there's a literature on the propagation of policy innovations or innovations more generally in heterogeneous populations. And where there are three basic mechanisms that this literature has analyzed. One is contagion, which is basically transmission via bilateral ties. So you could think of bilateral ties as intense technical collaboration, such as in the framework of 3GPP. Another is social influence, where basically the fact that a large number of organizations has adopted a certain policy constitutes a general norm which then creates an expectation that other organizations also follow these policy choices. And finally, and perhaps the most interesting for us, is, is the idea of social learning where basically the, the implementation of a policy choice in one particular setting creates and produces information for other organizations what the effect of such policy choices might be. And that obviously produces experimental value that other organizations might in incorporate. So our idea is to basically um, integrate this information into a table where we can say that different organizations are characterized by a preponderance of different constraints on their policy making. Um, there are some organizations that are tightly embedded in a, in a, in a network of hierarchical structures and this is what we call the first layer. On the other hand, there are organizations that are almost entirely free of these very formal legal and institutional requirements, but they are very much subject to competitive responses by their stakeholders. And that's what we call the third layer. In between these organizations, there is what we call the second layer, which we believe is interesting because they are more removed from both the legal and the competitive responses to their policy making, meaning that they are most, um, they might be considered to be the most likely candidates for producing policy innovations that then ripple through the innovation ecosystem. So um, the, the notion of the ecosystem that we then add to this conceptualization is, is based in, in, in innovation research more generally, where it often refers to any kind of structures of non-generic complementarities between actors that share joint interests in an overall performance of the system. And in the uh, standardization 
area, it's, it's actually quite common for actors to refer to the existence of a standardization ecosystem. Interestingly, that often arises in the context of educational and promotional activities. And there it, it often refers to a shared culture or norms of standards development, as well as shared interest in the financial and legal independence of standard development. You could think that the standardization ecosystem also arises in the context of systemic competition with other forms of organizing innovative activities. And basically, in this in this standardization ecosystem, what we see is um, is the emergence of an institutional norm, which is basically what we call the baseline IPR policy. It's a policy that is characterized by elements that are common to large numbers of SDO policies. We uh, include here the, the requirement to disclose ownership of potential SAPs and um, the expectation of commitments to license on terms that are at least friend. So these are not just choices by SDOs, they are reflected in numerous legal documents transposed in the guidelines issued by private organizations and sometimes even constitute boilerplate that is directly in verbatim adopted by hundreds of organizations around the world. So this baseline is something that allows SDOs to operate within recognized legal bounds and deviations from that baseline are individually costly for each SDO. So, so they must be motivated or can be presumed to be motivated by specific policy goals. So deviations could take the form of either attempting to achieve the underlying legal requirements through alternative means, not including one of the um, elements of the baseline policy, or going beyond the baseline policy, either in stringency, adding further requirements, being more specific, or having a more active role of the SDO. So these baseline plus policies, as we call them, are, as, we, as I just alluded to, um, a characteristic often of the second layer organizations that are least constrained in their policy making. And uh, we study instances in which sub baseline plus policies then become a part of the baseline. So they shift the baseline, meaning that the baseline can become a dynamic concept that evolves through these policy innovations within the system. There are actually not that many examples for that, but one example that we have studied is uh, stipulations regarding the transferability of a friend licensing commitment. So this is something that originated in some SDOs and then has become to be part of what stakeholders now nowadays considered to be uh, a legal norm uh, and um, an expectation of SDOs to incorporate that into their policies. So this is uh, basically a very short teaser about uh, what we have tried to, uh, to do with the material in this report and, and to embed that in, in some kind of conceptual literature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, presentation and uh, the Keep you kept the time very well. I, as we, as you know, we have the two presentation and then we have a, a discussion. So now, uh, Jorge Contreras has the floor. Great, thank you. Uh, let me share that. Very good. Um, so again, thank you for uh, inviting me to present at the uh, this this uh, session. Uh, this, this work is related to the work that uh, we just heard from Eustace, and as you can see, uh, this paper also uh, is uh, prepared by myself, Eustace Barron, and Pierre LaRouche. Um, again, as an outflow of the uh, previous work that we have done both for the Commission and on this ecosystem. And this paper focuses on one particular aspect of the organizational structure of standards development organizations. Um, yeah, and that is the balance of interests requirement. When we talk about standards organizations, we very frequently talk about a host of due process requirements that are either imposed or agreed by SDOs uh, to manage their operations for a variety of reasons, which I'll mention briefly uh, later. Um, one of these is balance of interests. However, um, as we have reviewed the, uh, the literature uh, in this area, it became very clear that this term balance of interests is not very well defined. Um, and there are numerous open questions um, that really have not been addressed ever in the literature. And so we set out to think about these questions to uh, look back at the historical record um, to analyze how these requirements uh, developed and originated, um, and then to more precisely define what they mean uh, 
um, especially because this question has uh, become increasingly important in recent years as debates over uh, the balance of different SDOs and SDO decision-making processes uh, has come to the foreground. Much of the paper uh, that we've posted is a historical analysis of the balance of interest requirements, both in the United States and in Europe um, over the years. Uh, this begins, the story begins in the 19th century um, and uh, is still evolving today. So there's quite a lengthy historical discussion and, and we believe this is a significant contribution. It is really the first historical analysis of this area of SDO governance that we are aware of. So uh, at least in that respect, uh, we think it's a novel contribution. Um, but these other more substantive questions also we think are quite important. Um, and I'll just go through these very briefly in terms of what our findings are. So the first question substantively is like, whose interests need to be balanced when we talk about a balance of interests? And the answers vary significantly. If you go back to the 19th century, early 20th century traditional view of standardization, it was largely a dialogue between producers of components and manufacturers of finished products in the industrial sector, automobiles, telecommunications equipment uh, for telephones and so forth. Um, large manufacturers wanted their uh, suppliers to produce standardized products. And so the view of standardization as a dialogue between producers and users uh, became dominant in the early 20th century and led to this traditional view that a balance of interests ought to exist between producers and users of standards. However, there are other incarnations of this type of vertical relationship. Um, producers and certifiers of products is a, a vertical relationship that we've seen emerge just recently in a case last year um, in the United States. More importantly, probably, and, and more uh, dominant in many discussions is the balance of interest of the consumer sector. Um, in many cases, historically and today, uh, there is a desire that consumer interests be represented in the standardization uh, discussion, and that has expanded to other societal interests, including interests of labor and employees, civil society more generally, environmental interests, and so forth. Um, so there is an active discussion and, and different methods that have been used to try to address these different types of uh, interests to be balanced, generally in a vertical manner. There are also uh, notions of horizontal balance that can be uh, uh, discussed in the standardization area. Um, some of the early classic antitrust cases in this area involved horizontal competitors uh, within a standards organization um, trying to influence decision-making processes and the classic case of Allied Tube and Indian Head from the United States involved a dispute between the manufacturers of electrical conduct, uh, conduit, uh, either steel or plastic, and a dispute within the SDO between them. Um, is balance really required between different commercial interests in, with respect to things like steel and plastic? Maybe, maybe not. The entire goal of standardization is to make technical choices uh, through consensus decision making. Um, if there is an effort or a requirement that uh, there, there be some sort of compromise that may actually dilute the standardization process. But most recently, a different type of horizontal balance notion has emerged in the standardization area. And this is uh, to take into account the differing interests of holders of standards essential patents and uh, firms that do not emphasize standards essential patents, but product manufacturing and distribution, what uh, we have called patent-centric and product-centric firms. Uh, this dispute, probably well known to most of you, emerged most prominently around the IEEE's uh, policy amendments that it approved in 2015, amendments 
that uh, patent-centric firms felt were not favorable to them and disadvantaged them in a variety of ways, which led to allegations that the IEEE decision-making process was not sufficiently balanced. So in the paper, uh, after going through this historical um, analysis of the US and Europe uh, situation regarding balance, we developed a taxonomy of different balance requirements that exist in the field. Um, and in this table is a little bit hard to read, but um, you can find it also in the paper and categorizes six different types of balance requirements that might exist and tries to identify the source of that requirement. So if we go to the allied tube case that I mentioned earlier, uh, there was uh, definitely abusive behavior going on in that case and the Supreme Court in the United States uh, sanctioned that type of behavior, um, that sort of legal prohibition on outright stacking the deck um, and abusive practices relating to voting in a standards organization must be uh, prohibited by the competition laws. But there are other more stringent uh, requirements around balance. So in the United States, uh, there are some regulatory and legislative measures that relate to standardization. The Standard Development Organization Advancement Act of 2004, the SDOAA, for example, uh, adopts a definition of balance from a, uh, a administrative document that we call OMB Circular A119. Um, there, the definition of balance is slightly different and is phrased in terms of domination and no single interest dominating the standardization process. Um, moving to the next level, some standards organizations do not uh, have any formal balancing process, but instead seek to make their processes as legitimate as possible by being incredibly open and transparent, IETF being an example of that. Um, Eustace mentioned the ANSI essential requirements. Um, these sorts of requirements are also reflected in uh, a number of the European organizations. Um, those organizations require a much more affirmative uh, effort toward balance. Uh, in the ANSI essential requirements, the STO must take affirmative steps to ensure that there is balance and, and many different types of organizations and stakeholders to be balanced are included. If an STO wishes to be accredited by ANSI or one of these other organizations, it needs to uh, seek that higher level. Some SCOs have gone even higher. ASTM is the most prominent example of an SCO that requires formal numerical quotas regarding the number of representatives of industry versus consumers, uh, producers versus users um, that can vote on their standardization panels. Um, and then finally, we have the area of policy balance, which I mentioned in terms of IEEE. Should policy decisions reflect a balance of different stakeholders, even horizontally um, within the SDO? So there are a number of open questions. I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Uh, and, and, and not all of these can be answered, um, but you know, we ask and try to give some insight into whether there is a legal floor. Is there a minimum requirement imposed by the law with respect to balance in standards organizations, allied tube and uh, cases that condemn abusive practices clearly are the law is something higher than that, uh, the law. We think that it probably is a level above the allied tube abuse level um, that uh, SDO should look to as a legal requirement. Um, where does consumer and societal balance fit in the discussion today? Um, do the same requirements apply to these horizontal uh, uh, balance issues as we see in IEEE as to the producer-user uh, dichotomy that the balance that originated balance requirements? And, you know, we, we uh, hope to extract from this some um, best practices uh, with respect to uh, balance overall within the standardization world. Um, although again, it, it may be a, a diverse enough world that there is no single uh, recommendation to be made. That's it. Thank you.
Uh, thank you. As I said, uh, these two papers uh, deal uh, talk to each other. Is, uh, now I think it's uh, the moment for Igor to try to get together <laughs> to street in his comment to both. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. It was my pleasure to, to read these art articles and it was very interesting for me because I'm also uh, researching and writing about standardization, but while I'm mostly focused on on patents, on SAPs, on licensing issues. It's, it, is, it was very interesting to learn more about standard development organizations. So I think both papers are novel in the sense that they are providing more, more evidence, more insights on how do standard development organizations work and also mostly how do they make the rules because the way they make the rules that impacts later the licensing negotiations. So while I would applaud all the papers, my comments are mostly uh, both technical and substantive. So on the organization ecosystem paper, so the paper I, I wrote, uh, I read, I understand it's a very early version. And so I don't really have much, much to add. The only thing I would like to see, for example, in the future versions is more, more evidence or, or more uh, more evidence to back some claims. For example, uh, but then you say that uh, certain SDOs are adopting uh, additional obligations, uh, balance neutral and balance plus. It would be nice to see, have a table of what are those SDOs and in what year did they, did they make the policy change. And in the end, what the only comment I have is, is, the, is the second part of the paper dealing with standardization ecosystem. So it was interesting for me to read how, how the impact, there is horizontal impact, but also vertical impact. And in horizontal impact, I would like to know how come that some, how would you explain that some uh, SDOs have presidential values and their, their policies were later followed by others in terms of, when it comes to reality free licensing with VITA, IPR policy, and why, why that wasn't IEEE example followed? And you did mention, for example, that it may be because it's a different, uh, different interest, different uh, industry areas, but it would be interesting to map exactly why, why some have more presidential value than others. And in the end, the last part of the paper talks about presidential value of competition authorities saying that uh, uh, SAP transfers, it wasn't used by competition authorities, but actually it seems to me that in practice there was a general agreement between SDO participants that if we don't, if we allow friend commitment whenever we transfer friend commitment, then that would gain the system. So basically my, my impression, and we don't really have an, an antitrust case as a precedent. So we have saying speeches by competition authorities, but I think really it's, uh, it's not speeches of competition authorities, but more of the view, general view of the industry that this is something that would gain the system. And if you follow the antitrust precedent, how come then Huawei versus ET framework, which is now a law in the EU, has not been uh, put into the IPR policies or SDOs. How come they're still vague and unclear? Also at the IPR policy, if antitrust has presidential values, how come nothing happened? How come they didn't change? And also I'd like to explain because we now have some cases about a global friend royalties and also talks about maybe the Professor Contreras wrote, would be the best place to adjudicate friend disputes and to see are SDOs actually doing something? Are they listening to, to those, those questions? And also you talk about presidential value of uh, Department of Justice business review letters. Again, it would be interesting to, to, to compare since 2015 IEEE business review letter have other, other SDOs followed I, my, my impression is they didn't, but now with the new business review letter, we will see later whether the IEEE will change the policy. So that's something to, to, to keep in mind. And in the end, I would like to know, well, what is your opinion? To where will we, how will we see IPR policies develop to the challenges that are presented now? 
in the will there be do you think will there be some global tribunals will they answer this via the countless litigation so what is a friend about the royalty base where to license in the in the value chain that's something that i'm talking about and my personal impression is that all those questions should be better solved by uh, standard development organizations themselves and why can they solve it then then we come to the balance of interest requirements my suspicion is that's probably because there is too many interest competing interest and they just can't can't come to an agreement so so that's that's on, on the first paper on the second paper i also liked reading it and they liked uh, as professor contreras mentioned this is really something new something that has not been done and there is a lot of talking about balance there needs to be balance about uh patent centric and product centric firms but we don't actually know what's the content of this balance and what does it actually mean in practice and how you traced in the development of the balance criterion in the us and in the eu and i like the table when you presented six different uh, balance requirements that you find in the literature so my question is what seems to me that there is only numerical quotas and abusive imbalance that provides some concrete obligations so you have to have quotas in decision making there can't be stacking of uh, and stacking of people voting uh, for for some or against our proposal but other four other four categories non-domination practical balance obligation to seek balance power policy balance it seems to me that they are all uh, all they're vague and all mean the same so there is a textual difference but is there actual difference and can you see is there concrete difference between those four policies except in the verdict for example what i think you may do and you do have i know you have uh, empirical data you can maybe check what are the membership structures in all these four different categories of balance requirements to see whether is there different structure of memberships and then you can draw some conclusions if there is no different structure then you can conclude well we are saying the same thing but only use different words or if there is a difference, then you can say, well, this policy, policy balance means different thing. This non-domination mean, means other thing. So we can draw some, some conclusions. And finally, what interests to me is what are the remedies? So for example, if company wants to say, well, there is no balance, the, the balance requirement of non-domination, policy balance, practical balance is breached. What do we do? Can we apply competition? law go to court and claim breach of ipr policies so can 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 some policies be enforced or are some too vague that they can't be enforced so basically my 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 questions are the questions that professor contreras asked so what does it mean to be balanced and when is balanced achieved so that's something i understand is up for the further research and I'd like really to to know more about these questions Thank you, Igor. Uh, I think uh, we'll, uh, uh, as you can see, there, uh, there, are, uh, there is one question in the, in the chat uh, for uh, both of the presenters. Um, and so uh, this could be addressed. Um, I also would like to add uh, one, one short question for um, Justus. Um, and I was wondering if this, uh, if there is, if if for this is a, an increasing tension on the of this standardization consistent with all this uh, um, crisis of international trade of globalization that we are seeing, uh, if this uh, or if the the fact that standardization is something different will uh, keep somehow the system more uh, uh, coherent and uh, more robust than what is happening in another area of transactional governance. That's a question I would uh, address, uh, ask. And uh, for uh, Jorge, I wanted to ask him if uh, he has a perception that uh, historically, his paper is an historical uh, view of the evolution of this balance concept also, 
if he th thinks that uh, because uh, standardization has become so much important in, uh, re in recent years, in, in recent decades, let's say, but uh, more and more, if he thinks that uh, uh, this balance issue will become more a public issue in which uh, uh, the governments will uh, kind of uh, cut a little bit the space of market to solve the issue if they will intervene more. Um, let's also say that there is a new, another question that just was added to the panelists uh, to, uh, about the, uh, yes, but that's a bit similar to my uh, previous question uh, the, related to uh, uh, WTO agreements uh, and the, if uh, we, you can see it also if this uh, um, you, if uh, because of the WTO role we are seeing this uh, uh, private standards play a role in stimulating innovation competition or uh, some, somehow substituting for it. But uh, let's go back to the speakers. Just first. first. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Igor Pierluigi, and uh, for all these uh, stimulating questions and comments. Uh, probably in the interest of time, I'm going to pick some of these, if it's fine with you, and, and, and develop a little bit further. Uh, um, so the first that I, I'd like to expand on is this idea of the precedential effect of, of some SDO policy choices, and, and what can we say about why a, a policy choice develops such a precedential effect. And I think we need to be very careful in what we mean by precedential effect. So one notion that we that triggers a lot of uh, resistance is the idea that uh, an SDO policy change becomes a precedent that is uh, another SDO is bound to follow. So I, I think that this is a notion of precedent that we don't mean to insinuate. So um, what, what the notion of precedent is that we, that we develop here is that SDOs are subject to, to requirements that are extremely generally formulated and it is not necessarily fully clear what this requirement is. And, and an SDO by, 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 being, by taking initiative with respect to a policy might basically generate the precedent of uh, saying, okay, under the current legal standards or the current enforcement practices of, the, of those who are, who are in charge with enforcing them, um, this policy would be deemed acceptable. Um, even that is, is a notion that has received pushback, but I, I think there's, there's quite some uh, support for that. The most uh, famous uh, in, in that regard, I would say is, is, it's, it's, it's related, it's not directly in SEO policy, but it's, it's the idea of, of patent pools, where you have a patent pool being developed and, and receiving a scrutiny by DOJ in the form of a business review letter that generates a template that was followed by 50 or 60 other patent pools that followed exactly the same institutional framework, just because they had received guidance through this individual business review. And SDOs follow the same model. So we've, we've seen that with business review letters, but we've also seen that with ANSI, where uh, the, the fact that an SDO, including royalty-free requirements, had been approved as being consistent with ANSI patent policy, signaled to other SDOs that you can adopt a royalty-free policy while continuing to be consistent with ANSI's requirements. So this is, this is really what we mean by precedential effect. Um, but I, I think that the the question uh, that 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 you allude to is more more general, and and that's basically the question: what mean what what determines whether a policy innovation, such as uh, the update of 2015, uh, has the potential to uh, to percolate and and to penetrate widely shared institutional norms, and and that's what we have seen in the case of the transferability of licensing requirements. So um, I, I believe uh, that we all agree that there is a large uh, importance of the intervention of antitrust authorities and courts in that, um, that there is uh, some kind of co-development of the pronouncements by public authorities and the pronouncements by SDOs. And you, you're right, I mean, the, the ultimate judge for that is, is a court of public opinion, so that there's a widely shared perception by industry stakeholders 
that not following this rule would be basically per, uh, gaming the system and would be prejudicial to all. And, but we believe that this widely shared view has been gradually built through these policy pronouncements and through these policy choices by individual SDOs. And there was a potential for SDO policy changes such as the 2015 IEEE change to follow a similar trajectory. There had been public pronouncements by public authorities that really from needs to mean something more, otherwise it becomes meaningless. And there, there had been uh, stakeholder groups pushing for this kind of interpretation. And there had been at least one SDO that was willing to incorporate that into a, a definition of a term that was shared by many different SDO policies. So there was at least in, in, in its infancy, there was, a, there was a potential for this kind of spread and this percolation in, in, in the institutional ecosystem that would have the potential to basically uh, clarify in a way what reasonable means for for a large number of SDOs. What I believe is, is a big part of why this policy was resisted so much, because it was viewed as potentially shifting the meaning of friend, not only in this particular organization, but for as organizations more widely. And uh, uh, I don't I don't think that we have a full theory predicting when such uh, a potential to percolate in this, uh, institutional norms is realized or not. I mean, clearly, uh, the the issue of transferability of licensing commitments was controversial but it, it was it was less controversial in a way that the behavior that was being challenged was being was was executed by a, a smaller number of actors and, and there was a larger consensus a larger group of actors willing to rally behind the notion that this is that this notion that this behavior is, is prejudicial so I, I i really like this idea of the huawei cte as uh as, as being one other clarification that could potentially percolate through the policy pronouncements of other SDOs. But one notion to really keep in mind here, and what I think is important for this idea of the ecosystem, is that um, these SDOs, they are in a way what we and Matli have called transnational regulators. So they are subject to competing uh, institutional and legal requirements because their standards are supposed to be usable all, all over the world and so their policies need to be malleable and adaptable to legal requirements all over the world. So I, I think that there is uh, there is uh, there is um, there is clearly a tendency for, for a European interpretation of FRAN to follow the Huawei CTE framework but that is not necessarily universally shared. And, and for an organization like, uh, like Etsy or other European SEOs, that's clearly a consideration that they, they, they want to have a policy that is adaptable to different, um, different legal requirements all over the world. And uh, why can't SDOs just solve it? What, what is the problem with, uh, I mean, I, I think we, we have different theories. We had theories on the internal architecture where we see that some SDOs have, as I thought George alluded to, have a high standards for, uh, for approval, which obviously uh, lead to a high degree of conservatism. But there are also reasons in the ecosystem. I mean, the, this tight uh, hierarchical structure is definitely prone to conservatism. But also, as we have seen, like the, the competitive relationships between SDOs are prone to conservatism. So there, there, there are quite some factors of inertia in the system. And it's actually interesting. And, and you really have to, uh, to, 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 to really think about the, the, the architecture of the ecosystem in, in quite some granular detail in order to actually see some kind of momentum, actually see some kind of potential for change in the system. Finally, I, I just want to conclude on that Pierre Luigi's question with regard to the trade conflicts and, and the potential for this to, uh, to basically uh, undermine the health of the ecosystem. I, I think that the most, uh, some of the most uh, interesting passages in this historical overview by uh, Yates and Murphy that has come out uh, last year on the long history of standards development was about standards development throughout the Cold War. Where, you, where there was clearly an even much more aggressive and much more hostile environment internationally than it was today. And even in that environment, there was a fruitful and consensus-oriented technical standards development across the, the Iron Curtain. And I believe that part of that is that there is this pretty stable culture of standards development. There, there are institutional norms that are shared by those who participate in that which 
to some extent at least uh, isolate them from from the expectations of whatever kind of interests that they represent and and they they have an interest in 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 from uh, perpetuating the the viability of the system and, and it's and it's it's basic viability yeah. so I, I believe that this will also play out in this that there's uh, there's a shared interest in keeping the system alive which which is a pretty powerful force i i think pierre wanted to add the something on at this moment before we go to the work you have no microphone you have to switch on your mic just to, to add a little uh, point on the presidential element. So in, in the paper, the bigger pa uh, report for the commission, we offer two theories. Huh? The first one is that there's a <clears throat> horizontal movement, but that is not precedent. It's, it's really one organization looking at what the other is doing and deciding to, to follow. Uh, I see uh, Jamie's comment about cross fertilization. This is what happens. So this is based on a voluntary adoption by another organization, which can be influenced, of course, by the ecosystem. And the precedential element would be if there's something above that creates a binding uh, statement. And that is the case, for instance, with, with Huawei. So I wouldn't expect all the organizations to adopt Huawei in their uh, policies because it is already there. And I, sometimes I'm not sure if the court actually realized how broad its ruling was because it it is a ruling of principle based on competition law. So in, it applies to all organizations. They know that if they don't follow, if the negotiations don't follow the Huawei choreography, you're potentially in trouble with EC or with EU competition law. So uh, there are two different theories. So I'm, I'm not, let's say, surprised that Huawei wouldn't have been taken by our organizations. They don't have to do it. It is binding upon them because it is an interpretation of competition law. Thanks, Jorge. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all for the, uh, the comments, Igor, and uh, also the uh, people in the chat. I'll just quickly uh, respond to a few of these. So um, I, I, I sympathize, Igor, with your question, your first question about whether this is all the same. And, and so my direct experience in standards organizations uh, involves two, the IETF, which of course has no formal requirements, and ASTM, where I was a committee chair and, and before every meeting had to fill out a spreadsheet that uh, checked off which categories people are in and people could not be admitted to vote until uh, the balance was achieved, which was a pain, <laughs> but uh, achieved something, I think. Um, in the middle of that, it's a good question. Are these all the same? I think in practice, the answer is possibly yes, although we have not done any kind of empirical survey uh, or interviews to find out you know, what SDOs are actually doing, which would be an interesting follow-up project uh, to do, I think. Um, that being said, the language, I think, does matter um, if this is ever enforced in court, right? Because even if in practice, everybody is sort of doing the same thing, uh, a group that has a standard or an affirmative obligation to seek balance as opposed to just a non-domination requirement may be different and it may be viewed by a court as more stringent. So I think there are two aspects to this in the interpretation in a dispute, but also the practical implementation. And I think we don't know exactly. And I, I do respond to Jamie Clark's uh, notes in the chat, uh, where it, it really vagueness is a feature, not a bug, uh, essentially. And um, that, that may be the case. Certainly, um, vagueness helps things move along uh, without too much debate. But as we've seen in cases from Rambus onwards, uh, it can come back to bite the SDO if, if there is a dispute. Um, the remedies point I appreciate, and that is this, that we, we should add a section uh, in, in this paper to the remedy. Um, competition law remedies, there are breach of contract remedies, there's non-accreditation or de-accreditation uh, remedies, and, and I think we, for the sake of completeness, ought to include that. Um, you know, uh, Pierre Luigi's uh, a point about sort of a governmental intervention or more public aspect to this. I mean, I do think we're seeing this um, already. I mean, the European Commission is interested, uh, has been interested for some time about the consumer uh, 
uh, and other, you know, broader societal involvement in standardization. But I think even more uh, interesting is the Department of Justice uh, quite uh, active advocacy um, in this area, both in the NSS case that I mentioned uh, in 2019, which unfortunately for analysts, like didn't really go anywhere. Uh, it, it was dismissed at a very early stage, but most importantly in the IEEE uh, debate, which we've heard about uh, already, I think the Department of Justice has elevated this balance conversation uh, to the public eye where, where it was not before. Um, and then just finally, uh, the WTO and international and developing countries uh, angle to all of this. Um, yes, this is important. Um, the, you know, the TBT actually uh, has one of the less formal balance requirements of, of any of these instruments that we looked at. Um, that being said, just in general to the, I forget who asked the question in, in the chat, you know, developing countries, um, I think my personal observation of this is that the larger developing countries, India, and if you even consider China a developing country anymore, I, I think I probably don't, but it was at one time, uh, their solution to this was really getting involved in the international standardization uh, world and organizations. And, and they have in a pretty, a China certainly in a very effective way. I mean, I show it paper from a few years ago that, that uh, Chinese uh, activity within IETF uh, skyrocketed um, in a period of about five years until they are one of the most dominant players uh, there. Um, certainly a preferable strategy to the go it alone strategy that China adopted um, in the 3G world. They are now very much in the forefront in uh, areas like 5G. On the international level, um, India, is very active through its own standards organization in 3GPP, uh, which is also uh, you know, one of the, uh, the motivators behind 5G. And so the large technologically focused developing countries I think are doing a good job here. Um, the question is what about everybody else, the rest of the world? Um, and I think they, their voice is not being heard. And uh, there has been surprisingly little call for balance in that respect. Um, outside of sort of nationally oriented organizations like ITU, um, which does have national, and ISO, which have national voting um, in the, uh, the more private oriented standards organizations, that's not a conversation that's happening yet. So very interesting food for thought and for further uh, analysis. If, if I may, just one second. I mean, I, I think that there is a, a separate notion which is becoming increasingly important, which needs to be distinguished from balance in some respect, which is the notion of diversity. So in IETF, you have that a lot. I mean, in gender and, and also in terms of national origin of the participants. So there is this expectation that there should be some kind of diversity, some kind of representativeness of the people who are using these standards. Um, I, I would hesitate to, uh, to put that in the category of balance of interest because it's, there's, no, there's no clear theory behind it that, there, that these people would develop standards in a way that reflect the interests of women or, or, or people of color or, or whatever kind of diversity that is, 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 is aspired for. This is really part of a larger conversation about um, creating a work environment that is diverse and, 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 uh, and equitable. Uh, so we, we don't really expand on that, but I definitely think that it, it's, it's heard quite loudly in the standards development world in, in some parts of it at least. Yeah. That's uh, an interesting angle. Okay, uh, so let's uh, uh, get started with the second session. Uh, in the near we have two papers. This section will be uh, more on uh, non-discrimination under fund and uh, there will be a paper by Marco Botta, one by Igor Nikolic, and then uh, Jorge Contreras and Pierre Larouche will be discussing. Uh, as before, we start with the... Uh, now my video is getting on. Yes, now it's in. Uh, we start with Marco, and then we have the second presentation, and then the discussion, and then again, we'll take uh, comments from the chat and uh, have a final discussion. Marco. Thank you, Luigi.
Uh, so in this paper, I discuss the principle of non-discrimination in relation to standard essential patents. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that has not been uh, uh, much discussed in the literature. Usually when we talk about FRAND, we think about fair and reasonable uh, aspect of the FRAND, but we never discuss the issue of the non-discrimination, the so-called ND proc. And uh, in the paper, I discussed about the principle of non-discrimination uh, comparing uh, the assessment under uh, competition law, EU competition law, so Article 102 of the treaty, and contract law, so the ND prond part of the front uh, commitment. Uh, I follow law and economic approach, uh, reviewing uh, the economics literature on the welfare effect of price discrimination and what economists uh, uh, say about the uh, assessment of the ND prong. And then I also review the case law of the Court of Justice and recent ruling by German and British courts um, in relation to the uh, application of the ND prong. Um, so what I don't discuss in the paper, uh, uh, it's uh, um, the market power, which is of course the triggering aspect of the application of Article 102. Uh, so market power of uh, the standard uh, of the owner of the standard essential patent and I also don't discuss uh, uh, the issue of license to all versus access to all um, a topic that will be then uh, uh, discussed by Igor in his presentation um, so when I talk about uh, uh, discrimination I have in mind the idea that the stakeholder differentiates the royalty rate requested from the different uh, licensees, um, which could be considered again a breach of the ND prong or um, a breach of uh, Article 102, paragraph C of the treaty. So I consider it as a possible exploitative abuse. Um, economists usually differentiate uh, three different types of uh, uh, price uh, discrimination. Um, usually economists agree that uh, second and third degree price discrimination are usually pro-competitive. They are justified by efficiency consideration, they enhance affordability. Um, while uh, first degree price discrimination, so personalized pricing, where basically uh, a firm can uh, charge different price uh, to different customers, has both positive and negative effect. So it's positive because it can enhance welfare redistribution, but also negative um, because by matching the maximum willingness to pay of the customer, uh, of each customer, uh, we have a transfer of wealth from the customer to the firm. And in the context of standard essential patents, uh, we can basically see uh, all the forms of uh, price discrimination taking place in the context of royalty rates uh, uh, negotiation. Um, so the question is also first degree price discrimination, personalized royalties um, also take place in the context of royalty rate negotiations. Um, in fact, we have a limited number of implementers and so the stakeholders know what is the, the uh, implementer's maximum willingness to pay for a certain license and it can adjust the request to the royalty rate accordingly. Um, then uh, what about the ND prong? So economists usually um, have rejected in the literature the so-called MFN approach of the ND prong. So the idea um, that the set holder should grant exactly the same royalty rate to every licensee is considered inefficient, inefficient as an approach. It does not uh, incentivize innovation. So most of the economy agree on the idea that um, uh, the set holder is required to grant the same royalty rate only when the licensees are similar, similarly situated. But usually there is no agreement on uh, what is the meaning of the expression similar situated. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, there is disagreement on whether implementers that compete in the same relevant market are also similar situated, uh, if they have to compete in the same relevant market, or also if implementers uh, operating in different relevant markets are sometimes similar situated. And also, um, it's a debatable the meaning of similar situated expression when it comes to the cost of the transaction. So for instance, uh, is uh, the set holder facing the same cost of transacting when uh, 
it licenses uh, uh, to one licensee an entire license portfolio and uh, uh, individual license agreements uh, concerning different patents, part of the same portfolio, to another licensee. Um, so this uh, remains uh, an open issue. Uh, let's now move to the legal perspective of the analysis. Um, so under Article 102, Paragraph C, a dominant firm uh, um, abuses its dominant position when it applies the similar conditions to equivalent transactions with other trading partners by placing them at a competitive disadvantage. Um, as I mentioned before, I don't discuss in details the issue of dominance uh, in the paper, but overall, I argue that um, uh, the, let's say, the uh, owning uh, a standard essential patents uh, does not lead to a presumption of dominance because of the phenomenon of, of uh, uh, self-sovereign declaration. So this requires a case-by-case -case analysis of the market power of the set owner. If the set owner has market power, then you can indeed uh, uh, assess a strategy of royalty rate discrimination under Article 102, Paragraph C. Um, so the, the meaning of equivalent transaction is clearly very similar, uh, this, this is what I argue in the paper, to the meaning of similar situated standard um, put forward by the economist. Uh, when it comes to the uh, second requirement, the idea of competitive disadvantage, um, we know from uh, the recent case law, the European Court of Justice in uh, uh, MEO, um, that such competitive disadvantage um, may cause a discrimination that is capable to distort competition. Uh, so there is no need to quantify uh, the distortion of competition, but there is a need for a competition authority to prove that there is a causal link between, in this case, royalty rate discrimination, uh, the disadvantage suffered by some licenses, and also a distortion uh, of competition in, down, in the downstream market. So the discriminated implementer, for instance, will not be able to launch a new product in the market because of the discrimination. And finally, the SEP holder will be able to put forward some efficiency defense to justify its uh, discriminatory strategy, for instance, uh, um, in some defenses related to innovation consideration, recovery of uh, past uh, R&D uh, investments. So these will be the steps of the legal analysis of case under Article 102, Paragraph C. Um, so when it comes to the uh, ND prong, um, we, um, we don't have, uh, at least from the Huawei uh, ruling of the European Court of Justice, much guidance. Um, in the very recently, we had two important judgments from the German Federal Court in Siswell versus Heyer and from the UK Supreme Court in Wild Planet. And uh, both courts achieve a very similar conclusion when it comes uh, to the uh, application of the ND prong. So both courts argue that uh, um, basically the SEP holder is not required to grant a uniform tariff to all the licensee. Um, so overall, uh, both courts support the idea of the similar situated standard when it comes to the application of the ND prong. But uh, there is still no agreement, at least in my view, about the precise meaning of this uh, similar situated uh, standard. So I come to the conclusion. Um, so uh, in the paper, I argue that uh, both Article 102, Paragraph of the Treaty and the ND Prong may sanction um, a discriminatory royalty rate uh, by the self-holder. So, uh, they basically they can work in parallel, there is a parallel enforcement, but the legal test is, is different. So clearly, from the end, in order to apply the ND-PRONC, you have to prove uh, that the licenses are similar situated and uh, the conditions are discriminatory, are different. While for Article 102, Paragraph C, the standard of proof is much higher. First of all, the set holder should have market power. And then we have uh, other cumulative conditions, which are uh, also quite difficult to uh, satisfy. 
um, especially uh, the idea that discriminated licenses suffer a competitive disadvantage. Uh, so this is not a surprise that so far there has not been a case in Europe of application of Article 102 para C vis-a-vis -vis a strategy of royalty rate discrimination. Um, there are some pending issues, in my view, that uh, should require some clarification in the case law. So, first of all, uh, I mentioned before that the economists argue that uh, a strategy um, of price discrimination would be uh, harm the consumer welfare when, only when it comes to uh, first degree price discrimination. So the question is whether also Article 102 paragraph C should only sanction cases of first degree price discrimination. This is at the moment not the legal standard uh, determined by the European Court of Justice. And also the second question in my view is the precise definition of the similar situated uh, licensee standard. So uh, courts in Europe I agree uh, that this is uh, the correct interpretation of the end prong, but they cannot agree on the precise meaning of this expression. So I conclude here, since we are already running out of time, I thank you for your attention and I give the floor to Igor for the second presentation. Igor. Thank you. Let me just share the screen. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to present a paper that I co-authored with uh, my colleague Jean-Sébastien Jean Borghetti, who is a French contract law professor and Nicolas Petit, professor of competition law here at EUI. So basically we focused on, on one, one issue regarding SAP licensing. And this is the issue that is now very topical, which is where to license in the supply chain. Does the end committee obligation regarding where to license and this is an important question now in the 5g context in the iot where many different uh, industries will now be using 5g standard and wi-fi for example cars domestic appliances healthcare devices they would all need to take a license and basically the policy issue is now is does friend require access to all or, or license to all and this debate is about uh, basically two different licensing model, models. And uh, in the smartphone industry or in ICT industry, the prevailing model is access to all model. This is where SAP owners choose where to license, which is typically the end downstream product. And the arguments for that is that basically this, this is more efficient. It allows cross licensing than smartphones are are actually implementing all the 5G, 5G and Wi-Fi, and it also saves transaction costs of monitoring. But now, in the mostly in the 5G era, we see a license to all approach, and uh, supporters say that well, the friend commitments means if you look at the friend commitments, it means that SAP owners should license to anyone who requests so, irrespective of the value chain, and it is also claimed that. Uh, SAPs are implemented in components, in chips, uh, only one, one aspect by 5 g connectivity in a car. Well, the car is not, uh, is not made for, for 5, 5G connectivity, it's made to, for, for driving, so it is just, just one small component, the licensing should be done component. Otherwise, if you license on downstream level, that is compared to tax or innovation. And now we have litigation in Germany where Nokia uh, apart from the patent pool, Nokia and Sharp have sued Daimler and they obtained the uh, injunction rulings in Germany. And Daimler also complained to the European Commission and German Commission, and we'll see if there will be investigations or not. So against this background, we, we basically investigate, well, what, what are actually the legal requirements? So we, we see there is a gap in the literature. There is mostly policy policy debate about what should be the licensing framework, uh, whether the friend should mean uh, license to all or access to all. But what we look is actually what does the law say? So we don't go into the normative discussion, what would be the best approach? We, we, we look at what, uh, what does the law say and what can you learn from the law? Why is this important to give legal certainty, clarity, hopefully avoid litigation and foster debate about uh, 
about uh, uh, future changes to the, to the law. So in this presentation, I'll analyze briefly contract, patent, and competition law, but in the paper, we also did the general principles of EU law. So uh, we think the first step when they want to talk about whether there is an obligation to, to license to all or not is to look at contract law. So the text, the friend commitment is generally accepted to be of contractual nature. And uh, the wording, the text of the friend commitment is important because we will see the different SDOs have, have actually different text of the friend commitment. So we can't say there is a general uniform threat commitment, but rather there are different texts that vary between SDOs. And in the European context, if you look at ETSI, the most important uh, IP, uh, SDO organization with regards to uh, 4G, 5G, etc. standards, now a complicated clause, as you, as you can see on the slide. And most of the contention is, well, uh, the IPR policy requires the to make uh, a, a friend license available uh, to sell these or dispose equipment manufactured. And equipment is later defined as any system or device fully conforming to a standard. So in the literature, there is a debate, though, well, does the word equipment mean uh, all, all type of devices or only downstream devices? And uh, we looked at, uh, from the contract law perspective, uh, we looked at what are the uh, how, how to interpret this clause and looked at what may be the intention of the parties and what why might a reasonable person interpret this clause. And in our view that IP, Etsy, at least Etsy IPR policy uh, cannot be read as imposing uh, license to each and every one across the value chain. Rather, the Etsy IPR policy just requires uh, good faith negotiation with manufacturers of end user devices. And this is because we think uh, uh, Etsy IPR policy mentions that licensing should be done only to, to, the, to devices and doesn't uh, mention uh, components, parts, or unit, and also to devices fully conforming to a standard, which is a factual question. And we will see later often a fully conforming device at least in ICT industry, is a smartphone. And also, we found indirect evidence that Etsy resisted proposals to modify its IPR policy to explicitly acknowledge that SAP owners should provide licenses to all, where, as you'll see later, Etsy has amended its IPR policy to, to include license to all. So, so, in other SDOs, they have different approaches. So. IEEE, for example, openly imposes license to obligation. They have a uh, very unambiguous wording to, to that respect. They say friend devices should be available to any compliant implementation, which is defined as any product, component, sub-assembly, and product. So they clearly impose an obligation to, to license even to component manufacturers. And then there is a third category of SDOs, which we think use a bit of unclear wording. They just say uh, licenses should be available to unrestricted number of applicants or to all, all applicants. And then the question arises, well, who are, the, who are those applicants? Can applicant be a component manufacturer, downstream manufacturer? And in the paper, we explained that this is a, again, factual question. It, it depends on the uh, very standard being implemented, but we caution about reading this too much broadly because SDOs can change their policies to clarify, like IEEE did, that they impose an LTA duty. Uh, at least in the ICT sector, there is a wide practice to license an end user device. And we will see that SAPs have wider claims that often uh, are not. Uh, cannot be subsumed just for a single chip. Now, in the, in the patent law, we also look at the patent law to see uh, whether there, there may be some, 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 some claim to, to argue that there is an obligation to license to all. And basically, from the patent law perspective, uh, only those, only those uh, that infringe claims of the patent need to take a license, and then only if the patent holder 
so as a rule from patent law, patent holders are free to decide whether they want to license their patents, they may refrain from licensing. And uh, if they do decide to make licenses available, they may set the terms of the license and choose where in the supply chain to license. And as the European Court of Justice recognized, friend commitment does not negate the substance of the patent right. So basically, if there is no positive contractual duty to license, like in IEEE, the basic principles of patent law do not, uh, do not give, leave the, to the patent owner to decide where to license the supply chain. And the first step is to see, well, actually, who is infringing the SAPs. So if the claims of SRP is limited to components, then we can argue that a natural place would be to license to components. But if SAP's claims are broader, then we can argue that this is a more complicated issue. And we basically looked at some studies and litigated cases, and we found that uh, uh, a study by Putnam and Williams, who analyzes, analyzed the claims of Ericsson's, Ericsson's patent portfolio. And they saw basically that none of SAPs claimed only the chip. They claimed various components uh, in combination, complaint handsets or handsets in networks. And we also looked at litigated cases where SAPs were found to be valid and infringed. And also see that none of those SAPs claimed only chips. So basically the conclusion is, at least to those litigated cases, they're not confined to a chip and uh, chip would not be, chip would not be the, the direct infringing device. Uh, also it's important to note about the, the doctrine of patent exhaustion. So basically it means that you can only license SAP either to to, uh, to one level of the production chain, otherwise, it, uh, otherwise by this doctrine, uh, patents are exhausted. So if you adopt a uh, license to all approach, uh, this would complicate the licensing while access to all approach, basically all the licensing is done at one portion of the supply chain. So just to check, I have lost, uh, I don't see you. Can you see me? Yes. Yes, Igor. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I lost, I, I lost you here. So the, the last, the last, uh, the last area of law is competition law. So it's been all, often claimed that uh, refusing to license to because of dominance. And we looked under the criteria of refusal to license single tests in the EU. And we found them actually hard to be satisfied because if you look at the first question, that refusal to license is, is license to SAP to component manufacturers indis indispensable. And we argued that this is not really the case because we need to, we need to differentiate between refusal to access and refusal, refusal to license and refusal to access the standard. So basically, these are two different uh, categories. Even though uh, component manufacturers may not have a license, they're not prevented from using the standard producing components and selling them to license and device manufacturers. And, uh, and this has been recognized now by the FTC versus Qualcomm case. Recently, the appeal court said uh, on legal test in the US, there is no antitrust duty to license to competitors. But importantly, as a matter of principle, it recognizes basically that if there is no license, there is no problem because Qualcomm was not enforcing against chip suppliers. It may include non assertion agreements. So, at least to chip, uh, chip manufacturers, there was no problem. Then the court said that royalties were chip supplier neutral. So the royalties charge are the same for all downstream manufacturers. They don't change between uh, depending on the use of rival chips. It said that at least in the smartphone industry, uh, it is consistent industry practice to license uh, on the downstream level. And as to the arguments that uh, licensing downstream allows Qualcomm to earn extra profits, it 
says valuing all profits downstream is not in itself an antitrust problem. So as we conclude, at least as a matter of EU law, is there an obligation to license to all? We think uh, there is not, unless uh, IPR, uh, SDO IPR policy expressly provides that obligation like IEEE. Otherwise the SCP owners are free to choose where to license. But that doesn't mean, although it's a legal obligation, uh, we don't go into whether this is this should be the best case in the 5G and IoT. Maybe in the 5G with cars or more uh, uh, consumer devices, this may change. Maybe in the IoT, it may be better to to license the chip level. But this is the question that I think SDOs must solve by changing the IPR policies, by defining it more clearly if they can. So this is a more of a research by professors uh, Baron and Contreras to see, well, can there be a consensus, how to change it, should we change it? But I think from the legal perspective, the, the way forward comes from clarification from the SDOs. And what we also clarify is that uh, EU law requires access to a standard. So not having a license doesn't mean that component vectors are prevented from using the standard. So having access to a standard can be achieved in various ways. One is having a direct license, the second indirectly benefiting by selling to licensed and device manufacturers, including non-assertion agreements, or even not having a license at all if the patent owner does not enforce patents. So that's, that's our conclusion and I'm happy to hear comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We move to the discussion because we are a bit late. Uh, Jorge and Pierre will discuss in, uh, in turn. Jorge. Thank you. So um, what here I need to share. Here we go. So uh, Pierre and I have agreed to split up the, uh, the commentary on these two related and uh, uh, very nice papers. Um, I will focus primarily on um, Igor's paper, uh, ignoring the EU competition law aspect. And then Pierre will talk about the EU competition law, both in uh, Bota's paper and uh, Igor's paper, right? So, um, and so we'll each take uh, just, just uh, a short, shorter amount of time. Um, so first, I, I, I like this paper. Um, this paper, I think, addresses a very important issue and one that is timely and one that will undoubtedly reach the courts uh, soon. Uh, so it's useful to have these careful analyses out there. Um, that being said, this paper, <coughs> excuse me, let me see, that there. It, it's confusing um, to some degree. The question that this paper is asking and the answers that the paper proposes. I, I actually found uh, Igor's presentation to be much more clear than the text of the paper itself, um, but this may be a function of three different authors uh, or, or a variety of things, especially the abstract um, makes it a little unclear what the goal is. Is the question whether there is an imposition of this license to all obligation by the law or whether the law permits that obligation to be imposed. Both of those uh, different points are sort of set out and, and it's throughout the paper unclear which is being answered. Then the third and fourth questions are I think equally fuzzy whether it's that Etsy policy imposes an obligation on its participants or whether all SEO policies do, the language is a little unclear there. And then I think finally, we have a normative question at the end, what is the best policy? Um, and that the authors, I think, you know, have, have probably answered. Um, okay, so the question, whether the EU law independently imposes this license to all obligation, um, there's a section on general discrimination law. And, and I think, I don't know that anybody is actually arguing that this does impose this obligation. Honestly, I thought that that section could just be a footnote because it doesn't seem to be a live part of the, uh, the debate. 
Um, the patent law is a much more important part of the debate, which uh, we've, we've heard about. But honestly, the, the discussion of patent exhaustion and claim scope, which Igor just went through, it doesn't really answer the question um, whether license to all policy is required uh, by the law or whether even whether it's allowed by the law. It's really irrelevant to that question. Um, at most, it may tell us what the outcome is, and, and it may go to that fifth question, the normative question. If license to all is required, um, then it's a bad idea. We shouldn't do it because not all of the patents cover the chips and uh, you know, you'll have to license at multiple levels, but it really isn't answering the question of whether this is required or whether this is allowed. Um, actually, it's an interesting point for a new paper, um, which uh, I think this could be a very rich paper. There's been a lot of discussion about claim scope um, and where in the supply chain uh, you want to license your patents. But again, this paper, I think, could be improved by being tightened um, in that we should know what the questions are that are being asked and what the answers are, and all of the arguments should directly relate to those specific questions. Then I think the meat of the paper, the most important part, is the contract portion. Um, whether uh, this friend commitment um, in, in implies this, uh, this duty, and I think this is uh, correct. It depends on the specific language of the Fran commitment. However, you know, there are strange things, like in the abstract, you know, in the discussion of French law, there's a question raised about whether French law gives a legal basis for the introduction of the L2A regime. And I, I just, I, but from reading the paper and knowledge of, the, I, I just don't think that that is accurate if there's a, if Etsy does not have this obligation, it seems like the analysis of the paper is it's due to the language of the Etsy commitment and not a prohibition uh, by French law. And if the IEEE, for example, um, wanted to enforce its policy in France, I'm not sure anything under French law would prevent that from happening. So again, I think the broad statements that are in the abstract, and I, I focus on the abstract because honestly, that is the only thing that many people will read of, of a paper, uh, including courts. So I would be very careful. The abstract is the most important part of the paper. The second uh, thing I would say on the contract front is that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis about Etsy. And is this paper supposed to be just sort of a legal brief talking about the Etsy policy? Or is this a general paper? Why do we have 13 pages on Etsy? Uh, with only three pages for all the other SDOs in the world. Um, the paper has references to uh, access to all as the industry norm. In Igor's talk, I think you much more uh, appropriately limited that to the wireless telecom sector uh, because it is not the case that access to all uh, is the norm in most standards organizations or most other industry sectors, if you want to claim that, I think you would need to show some data or evidence. But in most cases, whether we're talking about codex or other networking uh, standards, it's the chip manufacturer who gets licensed by and large. Um, but again, contrary evidence uh, to prove that point, I think would be important. Um, but a conclusory statement about industry norms uh, without any citation is is not appropriate, I think. Um, the question then is whether you can draw general influent inferences from Etsy's practices. Um, going back to uh, the paper that Eustace talked about in the first session, you know, is there certainly a risk uh, and there's certainly a circulation and precedent uh, basis for saying that if we decide something with respect to Etsy, that could influence others. And you may want to mention that and you may want to explain that's why you're spending so much time on Etsy. Then uh, let's think about the comparative analysis. So ATIS and TIA are important, um, not just because they were discussed in the FTC versus Qualcomm case, but because this is how US companies participate in 3GPP and Etsy to some degree. The standards that were uh, being uh, challenged and debated in the FTC versus Qualcomm case are the same 
standards that you're talking about with respect to Etsy, just governed by different policies. And the TIA policy is actually quite long and specific. Um, and so what does this mean? As you know, the Northern District of California ruled that HS and TIA's policies require licensing to all. That decision was vacated by the Ninth Circuit, as you know, on different grounds, uh, antitrust uh, theoretical grounds, unrelated to this. However, what is the interface and the interplay between the Etsy policy and the policies of these other member organizations of 3GPP through which uh, different national uh, entities contribute to what are going to be the 5G standards. I think this is a question that nobody has explored um, and one that I would actually like to uh, know your analysis of. Um, ANSI has a different standard altogether, right? ANSI's standard, uh, which is adopted by over 200 uh, standards organizations based in the U.S., is that uh, uh, licensing has to be demonstrably free of any unfair discrimination. Um, what is unfair? And the question that, that Anne Lane Ferrar and I raise in our chapter on this is, is, is fair discrimination okay? Um, that might be something that could be useful to you. It, this language is used, again, in more than 200 different uh, SDOs uh, based in the US who operate around the world. IEEE, of course, you, you have talked about, um, I think, in a, in, a, in, a, in a comprehensive way. Um, but one question that you don't address with IEEE is whether the IEEE's 2015 amendment was a clarification of its existing rule or whether it was something new. You hear both uh, points being made about this, and it's important, especially if you're talking about Etsy, which doesn't have an explicit uh, discussion of this point. Um, could you make the analogy that IEEE uh, had this implicit LTA requirement before 2015 and just clarified in 2015? If so, what is, uh, could that analogy be drawn to Etsy as well? Um, you say in the abstract also, there's rare cases where licensing obligations, and I think you mean LTA obligations, might be imposed on SEP holders. Um, is it rare? Um, I don't think so, um, but if you think so, you should share with us why you know that um, and what the data is supporting it. It is hard to make these sorts of quantitative claims uh, without quantitative data. Um, whether they're rare or not, um, you know, they, they are imposed voluntarily uh, on the step holders through the contractual uh, mechanism. So how is this like compulsory licensing? When you're talking about compulsory licensing, I think you're talking about the very first question, which is does EU law impose this uh, involuntarily on SEP holders? But most of your paper talks about the voluntary contractual mechanism. So the compulsory licensing piece is a little bit hard to follow. And uh, again, the statement that public policy calls for restraint in terms of compulsory licensing, this isn't even mentioned in the paper. So again, I, I apologize for harping on the abstract, but this is really the most important part of the paper and it makes some claims that are not even addressed in the paper. Um, history, you, you, I'll go very quickly through this. You do talk a little bit about the history. Um, you know, it would be worth digging into the history a bit more than just the Rosenbrock and Huber papers, which obviously were produced um, tailor-made, you know, to fit different sides of this debate. Um, what were companies doing in the 90s? What patents were they declaring? You know, do these questions about the patent claim scope uh, that were mentioned, uh, did they apply in the 90s? And importantly, what did the European Commission think back in the 90s? They're the ones who created Etsy, more or less. Um, the Commission does have an interesting 1992 report that talks about availability uh, to all, but what did they mean by available to all? Is it the interpretation of A to A that you give it? Um, I, I question that, uh, but I would be interested to see, um, you know, the support uh, that you have uh, in, in uh, looking back in more detail at the commission's statements here. Um, and so I would just conclude by saying I would urge you to be very clear 
about the questions you're asking and the answers to those questions. Does EU law independently impose a license to all obligation? I think you've per persuasively shown that no, it does not. Although I'll leave the competition law piece of that to Pierre. Um, does EU law permit SDO participants to enter into LTA obligations? I think the answer to that, as you've shown, is yes, contractually. Sure, they can do this. There's nothing prohibiting it under EU law. Does the ETSI policy impose this obligation on its participants? I agree with you, it probably does not, uh, certainly not explicitly. And then finally, do other SDO policies impose those obligations on their participants? Well, some do, some don't. Um, I think approaching the structure of the paper in this way, and I don't know why the numbering is off on this slide, uh, but uh, I do think that that then could lead you to the answer to the fifth question, which is your opinion of what the best approach is. Um, but at the moment, I, I feel confused, and I think these questions are somewhat uh, uh, clouded um, in the text of the paper. So that's it, thank you. And I will turn it over to Pierre to talk about the competition issues. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll activate the mic, and then I will take over with the presentation. There we go. So in the, uh, George and I, uh, I split the, the work by paper, but also by issue. So I will make my comments mostly on uh, the paper of Marco Botta, but also I will make some comments to the paper of uh, Igor Nikolic, uh, Nicola Petit, and uh, uh, Borghetti. I forget the first name. So uh, to start. So the paper of uh, Marco, that this is how I, I see it. So it's an exploration of the meaning of non-discrimination in the economic literature, which is the anti prong part and competition law, which is defined as 102C for the uh, purpose of the paper. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not summarize uh, everything. I think the, the presentation reflects the paper and it's a, it's a good paper. I like the exploration. I like that the work is done solidly. Uh, and the conclusion is that 102C TFEU requires market power in the examination, the ND prong doesn't, but the discrimination tests are similar, to put it very crisply. So I have some comments, of course, that's the, the whole purpose. Uh, the first thing is, why is the competition analysis restricted to 102C? Uh, and it's something I've seen in other papers as well. Uh, we get blinded by the list of 102 and the list of 101. Uh, it's not because 102C talks about discrimination that everything about discrimination is found in 102C. Uh, it's not a limitative list. So there's more to discrimination than 102C and in particular primary line discrimination is covered elsewhere by 102 as we know from the case law. Uh, more sp uh, there's another Smaller comment, I'm, I'm not sure about your statement that only first degree discrimination can be harmful, especially in the context of EU law where exploitation is also a possible source of, of liability, which you could have in second and third degree uh, discrimination. Um, another smaller comment, the uh, German case law that you mentioned, I think is, is questionable on more than just the issue of burden of proof. I haven't read the more recent cases, but last time I worked on this, there was a real problem about whether uh, in the uh, friend choreography, as I call it, you have to be able to show at every step that your offer is friend or whether you should not just go on, reply, and the friendness will be assessed at the end of the, the day. And, and some of the higher courts in Germany were, I think, not aware of how heavy it would become if you have to if you open the argument at every step of the way to argue that the offer is not friend, but it's a side point. Uh, there are a couple of statements of fact in the paper that I find personally a bit problematic. Uh, the idea that there's no arbitrage with different licensing conditions. Uh, yes, if you look only at licensing, but of course uh, the products that are produced <laughs> using these different licenses are in competition with one another and there there's room for arbitrage. Um, 
then uh, the, uh, you make the statement that the SCP holder must have sufficient knowledge to practice first degree discrimination. Uh, I, I don't think so. At least there's a big industry of consultants on royalty rates uh, and, and they work with intensive databases and so on. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think that SCP holders have all the knowledge to practice first degree discrimination. I think uh, the area is still very difficult uh, to practice. Uh, you know, otherwise we would know far more about royalty rates than, than we do now. So uh, on the avenues for future research, what I note in the paper is uh, the ND prong, you say it's contract law, but actually you don't link the economics literature with contract law. I think that would be something to be explored. Uh, if you say that the ND prong is economics literature, it's fine as it is for sure. And uh, you open a door and which you could go a bit further about the role of transparency and opacity in the assessment of discrimination, the extent to which the yes, answer to this might be in more transparency. And of course, then uh, the, the idea of the reference offer that comes out of Unwired Planet is, is quite interesting. But my bigger comment was to uh, put non-discrimination in a broader context. And here I will talk also about the paper of uh, Igor Nikolic and, and his co-authors. I, I like their paper, uh, but it suffers, I think, from this salami slicing approach that you go through every area of law one by one and you show that it doesn't apply and you kind of lose sight of the broader perspective. I, I find the paper sometimes doesn't do justice to both sides of the debate because it, it doesn't present their best possible arguments uh, legally because it, it's caught up in this slices. Uh, so again, my central point is there's more to non-discrimination than uh, 102C. Uh, and in particular, it can be part of a larger theory of harm and it can also be an, a remedial uh, device. So I'll say a few words on each of this and then I'll, I'll be uh, done with my comments. Uh, so a broader theory of harm. So we shouldn't get up, hung up on, on labels. So what if the case is not really about discrimination? And here I, I think in particular of the US Qualcomm case, uh, where you see that the Ninth Circuit has rejected the, the uh, reasoning of the uh, district court, uh, but that's for reasons of US law. I think in EU law, it wouldn't run the same way and you could construe the case. Uh, it's a complex case, but if you look at the maneuvering of Qualcomm, it is somewhere uh, in the same vicinity as the per processor licensing cases, the Microsoft cases of the 90s, and the margin squeeze cases. And it's easy for the US court to say, oh, margin squeeze, link line, we don't know this in US law. Uh, in EU law, it does, it is part of the law. So uh, that case could actually stick. And in which case the whole discussion is not a discussion about discrimination, then it's a discussion about margin squeeze. Uh, and that part is just not in, in the paper, in either paper. Uh, and, and here I, I find in the Nikolic paper, I, there's an element myself that I like being a, a professor of innovation and law about uh, the effect of the ATA approach, which isn't picked up in the paper, is that it does create an IP-free space at the level of component manufacturers. They don't have to worry about infringing any IP. They know that the license is at the end, uh, you know, at, at the final product uh, level, and that could be good for innovation. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, that's the intent of the policy, but that could be an effect that the component manufacturers feel relieved from the need to keep an eye on intellectual property all the time. They can do whatever they want. They can, inf you know, use patented knowledge or not, they know that it's gonna be covered anyway by the license that the end product manufacturer has. Okay, and then there's a lot of discussion about what does non-discrimination mean? And I would like to put forward another uh, idea of non-discrimination as a, because non-discrimination pervades the whole legal system and treat it very basically as a prudential principle. And the idea would be if you have two cases that have the same theory of harm, there's no reason to treat them differently. And if you don't see this, uh, you can have 
serious trouble. You know, the agency on the first occasion will say, yeah, sure, this was not right. You have to do this. If you come up with a second and a third case and the theory of harm is the same and you refuse to comply, then you can have serious consequences. So it's the least you expect of a, a, a party that uh, when the theory of harm is the same, they would treat every plaintiff or every complainant covered by that theory of harm in the same way. And then the question would become, are the end user manufacturers, uh, the device manufacturers and the component manufacturers covered by the same theory of harm? And I would argue, maybe not, maybe, maybe not. And, and the question becomes even more complicated if you uh, try to draw a line, which is hard to draw, but not impossible between a refusal to license and licensing under different terms and conditions. I think if there's a refusal to license, then we're dealing with, actually it's not the, it may not be a discrimination problem. Uh, whereas if there are two licenses, but two types of licenses, but the conditions are different, you could argue the theory of harm is different. These parties are in this different position. So it, it is perfectly allowable to treat them uh, differently. Uh, my last point uh, is that non-discrimination might also be just a remedial device. So not something that is part of the problem, but part of the solution. It could be imposed, even if the case is not about discrimination, as a remedy. And if you think of the US uh, case in Qualcomm, uh, maybe it's the best possible remedy to say, look, we, uh, we require you to grant licenses to component manufacturers, as opposed to uh, forcing you to unbundle the chip part and, and the uh, um, IP licensing part of your business. And if it's just a remedy, then it's subject to different principles. You essentially have to be sure that it's necessary or effective and that it's proportionate or efficient. Uh, and, and again, that brings the discussion in a different direction altogether. So uh, these were my uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh... I mean, uh, we are running late. Uh, you have seen there are some uh, questions in the in the chat. Uh, I want only make only a remark. I have the questions, but I, there is no time. I would only suggest a remark because uh, non-discrimination is so in, is, is such a fundamental, as Pierre was just saying, such a fundamental concept. Particularly, you know, there are a lot of examples and uh, that can be looked upon. A new one seems to me very interesting is Article 76 of the new Electronic Communication Code about co-investments, in which the code is saying things about uh, how you have to treat differently people that risk differently. And that's an interesting different angle of uh, uh, the non-discrimination. And uh, I think there will be a, a big discussion about this in the future, as uh, the code is... Uh, gets into the application in the countries. Um, I think uh, we have the final word uh, to Marco and Igor. So thank you very Luigi. Thank you, Pierre, for your comments. I, I found them very useful. Uh, I don't have much to add. I agree with your comments and uh, I will have uh, uh, then to review the paper in light of your comments. I think that there were no uh, questions addressed to me in the chat. So I, I leave the floor then to, to Igor also because we are running out of time. Okay, me also briefly. Thank you, Professor Contreras for the comments. And I actually agree with all of them. And I like this peer review because uh, I agree that abstract is not clear, but it wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware of that until you pointed out. So this is why peer review is good. Sometimes when you write articles, you just don't see the bigger picture and yes abstract is something that should be made clearer but i think you you got the point in the end right so what you wanted to say is that eu law does not impose license to all at cipr policy as it is now also does not impose ieee does impose and other sdos though some do some don't. so we need to look at text and i agree about the comment on patent law so what interests me further and some further research, so I think in smartphone area, there is a lot of research and patents do co cover smartphones mostly, not only chips, but what about uh, in the 5G? Do they cover cars or not? Do they cover uh, some, some IoT devices? 
I am skeptical, but that's something I think for a further research project to look at some claims, some representative sample and see what is being claimed. Maybe in the 5G, there will be arguments to license on a chip level. Uh, also comparison with other industries would be good, like you mentioned, to see that this is not universal. But so, so far, like we said, legally, we don't see yet uh, a positive claim to impose the duty. And also as Professor LaRouche mentioned uh, the, uh, about the slicing, that paper needs to be done. Uh, it needs to be clarified. It needs to be more a bit, I think, cut by, by 30%. So hopefully the final version will be more coherent and arguments will flow clearly and the abstract that will certainly be changed. So thank you very much for, for comments. Uh, well, I think we have to conclude. We are past time. Let me uh, remind you that all the, pa the four papers are available so they can be read and I think they are a very great reading. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, all the participants for being here at uh, this late uh, time and with uh, this online effort that is always uh, more difficult. And uh, obviously let me and uh, all the speakers and the commenters was very, very, very interesting. And I hope that the next time we can do this in Florence. Thank you very much.